before I uh, jump in, I, I want to, I mentioned this last week, and I, I want to briefly mention a little bit about uh, what we are calling mentor groups, which is uh, kicking off in February. And I, I honestly, this isn't just like trying to hype something up so that you'll get excited about it. This is something that since day one, when really even before I think we came up with a name for what this was going to be, uh, this is something that was on the forefront of my mind and something I really feel like God was clearly saying, like, don't, don't leave this behind. Don't dismiss this. Um, and the whole idea was really that we would make disciples, which is what Scripture tells followers of Jesus to do. It's the last thing Jesus said to his followers when he left. He said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And wherever you go, I'll be with you. And um, so we've been processing through that. We've been working through that. And uh, so what mentor groups is is simply this. It's, it's just that. It's showing us, showing each other what it looks like to follow Jesus, because that's what a disciple is. A disciple is a word we use a lot in church and we use in a lot of different contexts, but really what it means, if you want to boil it down to one thing, it means that uh, a disciple is someone who is showing other people what it looks like to follow Jesus. We're mentoring them. We're showing them. We're modeling it for them. And the reason we're going to do this the way that we're going to do it is because I think it models what Jesus did. Jesus mentored not somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, sure, there were one-on-one -on -one interactions, but there was a group of people that he really focused in on. There were the 12 disciples, and he spent three years pouring into their lives, showing them what it looked like to, to be men of faith, to um, live life how to trust the good plans for them. And so we're gonna kind of jump into this. And so February 4th is an informational gathering. That's all it is. There's no commitment, but it's an opportunity for you to come hear more because I could literally stand up here for about an hour and tell you more and more and more, uh, but I don't wanna do that. But it's an opportunity for you to say, you know what, I, that sounds like what I need because my faith is, is decent, but beyond Sundays, it, sometimes I get lost. I get lost on what is this supposed to look like? What is it supposed to look like as a as a boss, as an employee, as a classmate, as a husband, a wife, a mom, a dad, as a friend? What does it look like to really follow Jesus in every area of my life? And um, so there's mentors that have been training and have been getting ready for this, and uh, they're going to be mentoring people in groups of eight, no more than that, so that there's very intentional time and focus. So if that's something you might be interested in, I'll continue to talk about this in the next few weeks. Uh, I want to share a little bit of detail about that, but sign up, register for that date on February 4th at 5.30, right across the parking lot in the Tomball ISD event center, which is at the north end zone of the stadium next, to, next door. So um, it'll, be a, it'll be a good time, and then we'll launch the mentor groups a couple weeks following that meeting um, for those that are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to jump in and be a part of this. And it's, it's a nine-month commitment. Um, so it's, there is, a, there is a, a stop on it with a really, really specific, clear goal. And uh, I'll share more about that next week and the following. But uh, let's jump in today. Last week, like I said, we kicked off a teaching series entitled Habits, New Year and New You. And so today, I, I want to throw this question to you. When you think about just a normal day, what does your normal routine look like? What does a normal day look like for you? If you, if you work, what, is, what does that look like? If you go to school, what does that look like? If you're a stay-at-home parent, what does that look like? Because yes, that is a job and you need a raise. Um, so whatever you do, whatever a normal day looks like for you, what, is it, what does it look like? Think about that for a second. I mean, most likely an alarm goes off at some point or you're one of those that have incredible self-discipline and you just have this ability to wake up at the same time every day and just get out of bed and start singing all kinds of fun songs and you're just like ready to roll. But for, for everybody, we wake up, an alarm goes off, we get out of bed and uh, maybe you go to the bathroom, you, you look in the mirror and scare yourself for a second and then maybe fix your hair, go into the kitchen and make yourself a cup of coffee and maybe some breakfast, some oatmeal, some toast and and then maybe spend some time reading your Bible or writing in a prayer journal, waking up your kids, helping them get ready for school, getting ready for work yourself, take a shower, hopefully. You know, that's a good thing. That's how you keep a job. Um, take a shower. Go to work. You get to work and you're working with the same people that you worked with yesterday. Like your day is actually starting to look a lot like yesterday and the day before that. There's similar things happening on a normal day for you that probably happened the day before. You continue through your day or going about doing the routine, normal tasks, and come to the end of the day, you drive home, you get home, and then you think back, I don't even really remember going through any intersections, but somehow I made it home, and you don't even have to think about it because it's so routine. It's so like, it's just, it's just what you do, which is kind of scary behind 2,000-pound automobiles, and we're not really 
aware if we're in control or not. Um, but your day just continues on. You get home and maybe you work out, maybe you start to prepare dinner, or maybe you're one of those fast food people because nobody else in your house will help you make dinner. And then if, uh, if you do make dinner, they don't help you even with the dishes. And so you just get a little bit upset with that, which I think is okay. Like that's, that's okay to do, uh, maybe. And then your routine continues on. Maybe you have kids and that just has a whole other dynamic, especially if they're little. So then you got to get to that point in the evening where it's, I got to put my kids to bed. So I got to put them in the, in the bathtub. And there's always that one that wants to like be the escapee. So you're running after him, hoping the others are doing what they're supposed to do in the bathtub. And uh, then you get them out, you get them ready for bed and pick out their clothes for school the next day and get their lunches packed and put them to bed three, four, maybe five times if, if your house is normal like most of us. Um, and then finally they're in bed and it's quiet. And then you have just some you time. And so maybe you check out social media, you binge watch your latest Netflix show or you spend some time journaling and then you go to bed. And for the most part, your day looked a lot like the day before, similar to the day before. Most of what you do every single day is not a result of conscious decisions, but is a result of habits. So what that means is you're not, you're not making these distinct choices throughout the day that dictate every single little thing, habits have been formed in your life and those habits are actually causing most of the things in your life to happen the way that they happen. Duke did a study in 2006 and it said that 40% of the actions you take in any given day are not a result of decisions, but are a result of your habit, which I think forces us to consider why we're even in this teaching series. Because if you wanna change your life, then maybe we start by changing our habits. If you want to change where you're going in life, then maybe we change our habits. If we want to change who we're becoming, then maybe we should change our habits. Last week, I quoted a, couple of, a handful of books, and a lot of, I've read several books. If you follow me on social media, you saw the list or the picture that I posted, and this is two of those books. And then this specific book is one I quoted last week. And uh, going back to kind of what I mentioned from Atomic Habits by James Clear, He talks about how most people in life have the same goals. Like we we all want to be better. We all want to continue to grow. Uh, Married couples want to have a a good marriage. Sports teams want to win the championship. Everybody wants to be healthier. So we all have similar goals, but the results can oftentimes be dramatically different. And so what he went on to say is basically the statement I shared with you last week is that your Success doesn't rise to the level of your goals. Success rises to the level or it falls to the level of your systems. So let me, let me just kind of dumb it down a little bit more for us because that's what I have to do so that I can really understand things. But this is basically what he's saying. He's saying goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. And so we talked about this. We, 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 we had some ideas on, on what that might look like. And so today we're gonna kind of jump in a little bit more and put some more practical things to this Idea. And so if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Daniel chapter 6, we're going to start in chapter 6. I mentioned this story, and so I'm going to give you just a moment to turn there. Daniel chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. Um, and I told you this last week, but this message is a little bit different than the way that I typically teach. Now, last week is that way. Next week will be this way. It'll be the last of the three messages that we'll do on habits. But um, it's a little bit more taking some scriptures from different places and focusing in on some specific things that are true for us in the context of habits. Most of the time when I teach, I'll, I'll take a passage of scripture and I'll, I'll study that passage. What is this passage telling us? And uh, that's the way that I prefer it. And I know that's the way some of you prefer to be taught. And so I just want to give you a heads up that 2024, I'm not shifting that. Um, and actually, we're going to go all in with that. In two weeks, we're kicking off a teaching series on the book of Jonah. We're going to walk all the way through the book of Jonah. We're going to study it and find out what that means for us. Um, so that's a little preview of what is to come. But for today, I want to show you an example of a guy that I actually mentioned last week, Daniel. And I want us to look from a spiritual perspective at maybe a system that he has in his life that helped shape who he became, shaped who he was, shaped the identity that he believed to be true with him. Just one, one system. And so the title of today's message is simply that, start with one. What would it look like for us to just start with one? Now, if you've been around church at any point in your life, you've probably heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den, which is a phenomenal story. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, Daniel 
has the faith to stand strong in the face of lions that are hungry and ready to eat him and devour him. Like you put a mouse in my house overnight, like I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna die. Daniel stands strong to the lions. Anybody with me? Like mice are, are the worst. Okay, I see some hands up. Um, I see some men like me holding their hands up. That's, that's, that's good. Um, be proud in your fear of a little four ounce animal. But maybe what's most impressive about the story of Daniel is not that he stood in the face of lions, but what we read in this passage, Daniel 6, verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to appoint the 120 satraps over the kingdom to be in charge of the whole kingdom. So these are 120 government officials. Like they have, a, they have some level of authority to um, tell people how to live on how to operate as a, as a citizen of the kingdom. And so he's appointed 120 of these. And he says, over them, there were three commissioners of whom Daniel was one so that these satraps would be accountable to them and that the king would not suffer loss. So he's got a system in place for governance. And Daniel happens to be one of the three supervising satraps. And so this is interesting because Daniel is not, he was not born in Babylon. He was not a Babylonian. He was actually brought from the people of Israel. He was brought in. He was living in exile. His family had been taken away from him, had probably been murdered. And so he's, he's living as what was once an enemy, and now he's in a place of leadership. It continues on. Fascinating. In verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed, and maybe you need to underline this, highlight it if you've not done this before. Um, it says that he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king intended to appoint him over the entire kingdom. That's That's, that's crazy. Because if you begin to remember and think back to who Daniel was, now Daniel finds himself in a place where he's living in the land of the enemy, but he's still a man of faith, and he's in a place where God has allowed him to reach the top of the leadership chain in Babylon. He's about to be put as the second man in charge. Darius trusts him. Why? It says he has an extraordinary spirit. There's something that stood out about Daniel. There was something significant about his life. We don't know exactly what it is at this point in the story. Maybe there were some leadership gifts that he possessed that God had given him. Maybe he just had great relational um, skills. He was really good at putting other people above himself. Uh, maybe he was just incredibly humble, but he had found himself in a place where he had an opportunity for more, an opportunity to lead. But there's something else that I think allowed him to find himself in this place where he stood up among not just anyone, but among 120 other leaders, so this is a leader of leaders who all of a sudden has been promoted to this place of even greater authority. Look what happens next in verse 4. It says, Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel regarding government affairs, but they could find no accusation, they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption because he was a trustworthy and because he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. So these Commissioners and these other satraps are frustrated. Listen, anytime you begin to have any kind of success, there most likely will always be at least one who is trying to wreck that success, to take that success away from you, to, to rob you of that opportunity, because that's just the way we are. We have a hard time being excited about somebody else getting promoted, especially if it's something that we wanted to be promoted for. So he finds himself in this place where he's finding success. He's got this extraordinary spirit, and there's these people that are trying to rob him of that. They're trying to come up with a scheme, trying to come up with a plan, trying to find a weakness or a flaw in his life that they can use against him so that he doesn't get this promotion because they don't want him to have it. Then in verse five, it says, then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him regarding the law of his God. So they couldn't find any flaw. They couldn't find any weakness. So what do they do? They use his faithfulness to God as a tool against him, as a weapon against him. I started thinking about this this week. It's 2024. We're jumping into a year where we're going to have a presidential election in November. And I just, I just got to be honest, it's going to be a circus. The campaign trail is going to be unreal. Like, I feel like we're already seeing things that you never could have made up 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Like my grandparents would look at this and be like, what in the world has happened? Because the campaign is insane. Because what do they do? They spend relentless effort trying to completely just wreck the other candidate. I mean, I don't know where you stand politically. I'll tell you where I stand politically. Just kidding, I won't. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know where you stand. But as you know this, 
donkey, elephant, poop comes out of both, okay? And it, listen, I have... I value governance, I, get, I value leaders, I, I value government, I, get, I, I value the political process. I think it's good, I think it's good for us, but it's not the end all, it's not everything. And I think what we see, even in 24, is we see the breakdown, we see the flaw in something that oftentimes I think we can look to as the solution. And what you see happen in every single campaign is actually what's happening for Daniel. Like they are trying to make it where he doesn't get the job. He doesn't get the office. And so they begin to use his faithfulness against him. And so verses six through nine, it continues on. And they come up with this plan and they go to King Darius and say, King Darius, uh, listen, we think it would be really valuable if you would just create this decree. You would, you would create this, this law for 30 days that if anybody prays to anyone except for you, O King Darius, I mean, they're probably trying to puff him up a little bit, make him feel good about himself. Listen, if, if they pray to anyone, other than you, for the next 30 days, then they're going to be thrown in to the lion's den. Well, that's a terrifying idea because I told you, I'm, I'm afraid of mice and you're gonna throw me in with lions? I don't know how you would respond. I know how I would probably respond, but look how Daniel responds. Like what made it, what was it that made Daniel stand out from the rest? I think he has a system. He had a system. And I think that's what we see in this next passage, a system, a small habit that maybe over time began to do something great in his life. I think we read about this in verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the document was signed, he entered his house and in his roof chamber, he had windows open to Jerusalem. That's significant because remember, where was Daniel from? Jerusalem. And so these windows are open. I think it was a reminder for him that he had put there on purpose. He left these windows open. He faced Jerusalem because I think when he looked to Jerusalem, he remembered who he was and whose he was. And like I said last week, when you know who you are, you know what to do. And so Daniel is looking at who he is, who he was, whose he is. And it says that he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and offering praise before his God, just as, don't miss this, maybe underline, highlight this, just as he had been doing previously. So what did he do? The same thing he did yesterday. The same thing he did last week. The same thing he did in January of last year. Like he, he did the same thing. He got down on his knees three times a day and he completely disconnected from everything going on in his life. He practiced the system. He practiced the habit where he would seek God. He would praise God. He would call out to his heavenly father. He would bring his burdens to his heavenly father. He would, he would plead for other people to his heavenly father. He would ask for direction from God every day, three times a day. I think you see this system, and it was a system that was intentional to cultivate an intimacy with his God so that he could be fully known by God and he could know more fully God. He, he wanted to press into this relationship and, and experience everything that was available to him in his relationship with God. He was living out the system, and his life was being shaped by that habit. It says that he had an extraordinary spirit. I think it's really easy for us today to underestimate the work and the move and the shaping and the correction and the, the shifting that God wants to do in our lives with just one small, simple step. And then repeat that step and become consistent in that step, creating a habit so that he can to work in us to continue to remind us who we are, but also what he's called us to do and the life that he's called us to live. It all starts with one simple discipline. And I think that maybe that's something for us to take some advice from. So here's kind of what I want us to consider. What if you started one new discipline this year? Just one. What if you started one Discipline. You think, man, that's not really that significant. I feel like I need to do more, Wes. Do you know what my life looks like? Um, I don't know what your life looks like. I know what mine looks like. And it feels like, yeah, I need to do more than, than one thing. I need to focus on several things. But what if we just said, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop and do one thing. And I'm going to practice that. I'm going to focus on that and watch God work in that. And in that, watch him shape a new view of myself Watch that shape a better understanding of who he is, a better understanding of what his word says and what that means for me even today. 
to begin to understand more clearly what it looks like to make a difference, to be an ambassador for Christ. As I continue to practice this one system, this one discipline, this one habit every single day, what would this look like? When I think about discipline, and I've thought about this a lot over the last several weeks I've been preparing for this, I think about my dad, because I'm not sure that there's anybody on this planet that I've ever met that's a more disciplined human being than my dad. He's really simple, but he's incredibly disciplined. I mean, he's a guy that takes care of himself. He takes care of his body. He takes care of his family. He he's stewards the things that, that he's earned, the things that God's given him, the gifts that he has. He stewards those things really, really well. He watches what he eats. He doesn't have any debt. Like, he doesn't even have a mortgage. Like, I don't even, that doesn't even make sense to me. Like, that's like magical or something. Like, that's like a fairy tale um, off in some lala. Like, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get that. But he's, he's, he's this way because he's always lived with this one. But even more than that, I've watched my dad my entire life live out a disciplined life of faith. I've heard him talk about it. But more than I've heard him talk about it, I've watched him live it. And even as a kid, I remember just watching my dad do things. I remember getting up, getting up in the mornings and getting ready for school and going into the kitchen and the, the dining room and, and looking into my dad's office and seeing my dad there with his cup of coffee and his, his oatmeal with his Bible open, reading scripture, praying, spending time with God as a, as a grown man with, with a full-time job and two part-time jobs to, to make ends meet for our family. But yet he would carve out intentional time. He would pray for us. He made it a point to pray for us all the time. My mom and my dad both would do that. They had these disciplines in their life that, that were non-negotiable. We went to church every Sunday. Like it was not, there was never a day where I got up and said, Dad, I really just want to sleep in today. Can we just sleep in? Like I, I, church will be there next week and the next week. Like they don't take any Sundays off unless they're church story and we took a Sunday <laughs> off. But like, let's, let's take a Sunday off. There was, that was never on the table, which is fascinating to me because now as an adult, I look back on that and my dad, my mom stayed at home. My dad worked three jobs. He was a DPS trooper. And so um, they're not making mega millions of dollars. And so um, he worked uh, two side gigs and to make enough money for us to, to live comfortably and to, to have what we needed. We didn't have a lot, but we had what we needed. And he did all this, but here's what's fascinating to me. Even with three jobs, he always took Sunday off. He never worked on Sunday. It was, it, was, it was fascinating to me to look back on that. And now as an adult, I'm like, man, I got way too much on my plate. I'm trying to do too much. Everything's going on. Oh, but I can take a day off. But he lived with this discipline. And here's what's, what I appreciate about that is that not only has that made a difference in his life and who he is, but that's made a difference in my life. That's shaped the lives of my two brothers. That's shaped the lives of those around him, his coworkers, his friends. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who know my dad or have known him for any length of time and have said to me, Wes, you know, I hear the saying, I want to be like Mike, but I really just want to be like Bruce. Like Bruce, like to be like Bruce. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's true. And when I think about that, like he, he's a man of discipline. And I want my life to look like that. I want to be that kind of a man. I want to be the kind of guy like my dad who someone would go to advice with. Like I can go talk to my dad about something. I can have my mind made up and say, dad, here's what I think I need to do. And he'll just gently say, Wes, I don't think that's probably the best. And I'll argue with him knowing he's right. And I'm like, no, dad, I think it is. Like you just don't understand. And then I'll get off the phone. I'm like, man, I hate it when he's right. And then I'll listen to what he says because he's got wisdom. And it didn't just like land in his lap one day. I think it's a result of consistent, small, simple, disciplines over the course of many, many years. I think we see this in Daniel. Daniel stopped and he prayed three times a day. Charles Duhigg in the book, The Power of Habit, I mentioned this last week. He talks about something, and I've talked about this before. He talks about a keystone habit. And a keystone habit is this. A keystone habit is a certain habit in your life that when you have it in place, it helps propel you onto a helpful, healthy, I would even add, a God-honoring a God lifestyle, a God-honoring life. So it's this, this one discipline. I make my bed. I've talked about this before. Um, there's studies that show that successful people make their beds. I didn't, I didn't make that up. You, I'll send you the article. Um, but I make my bed. And the reason I make my bed is because I grew up in the household of someone who was incredibly disciplined and he required his children to be disciplined. So I was disciplined. We made our bed every single day. I wasn't disciplined. I just knew that it would hurt if I didn't make my bed because my dad believed in the paddle and the paddle was not something that I enjoyed. And so um, we made our beds. And so I got to college and you know what I did? 
I went into full rebellion. I quit making my bed. I was like, I'm not making my bed. I don't have to make my bed. My dad's not going to walk by my room and be like, hey, son, you're going to make your bed because if you don't make your bed, da 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 is going to happen. And so I would just not make my bed. I realized this several years ago. Actually, when I read that article, I started reflecting back on my own life. I didn't make my bed for probably two and a half, three years. I got out of the habit of making my bed. And then I dropped out of college and said, I don't, I don't need this. Started working. I was still working. I was still, you know, a decent human being. But I wasn't making my bed. And then I decided I was going to go back to school. You know what my GPA was my first round of college? I won't tell you, all right? <laughs> it was about half of what it could be. You can figure that out. I went back to school. And before I had gone back to school, coincidentally, I just decided I was going to start making my bed. And so I started making my bed. And here's, here's, here's what it does for me. When I, when I, when I make my bed, it, it shapes something in my mind of saying, I'm not just going to do what's easy. I'm going to do what's right. And I need, to, I need to make my bed. And so I, I would make my bed. You know what I made my first year of college when I went back to college? Double what I had before, <laughs> a 4.0. Like, I didn't think that was possible. Now, is, that, is, is it because I made my bed? Is that the only reason? No, but I think what it does is when I would get up and I would make my bed, it would set my mind on this idea, I'm a disciplined person. I'm gonna do what's right, even if it's not easy. And so I, I make my bed every day. I still make my bed every single day. On days where my bed's not made, it just throws me off, throws things into a funk. And I feel like, man, something's not right. Something's broken. Something's chaotic. It's a keystone habit for me. You're like, oh, that's a little bit ridiculous, Wes. Making my bed, is that what I need to do? Maybe it's not, that's not what it is for you. You won't be as successful in life, but maybe that's not what it is for you. <laughs> for Daniel, I think his keystone habit is he would stop for three times a day and he would pray. He would carve out time to focus on God and it began to change things in his life. A lot of things in his life began to build around that. It began to shape the way that he thought about things. It began to shape the decisions that he made all through one consistent small act of obedience. I wonder what that would look like for us. If you were here last week, you heard me talk about this, and I'm not going to recap everything because we don't have time for that. We really didn't have time for that last week. But we talked about what would it look like to make New Year's resolutions, not in January this year, but in February. And some of you thought I was joking. But what if we waited till February and we spent the month of January not focused on what we need to do, but focused on who? Focus on who do I want to become? Who does God want me to be? What if we focused on that first and then focused on the do. So hopefully you've spent some time doing that this week, focusing on who does God want me to become? Who am I supposed to be? A godly spouse, a godly parent, a godly boss, a godly employee, a godly teammate, someone who's healthy, a a bold witness, someone who who wants to break generations of obesity or break the the slavery of addiction and be clean or sober. And what would it look like to, to begin to, become more of who I'm supposed to be. And so we spent that week, hopefully you spent some time thinking about it. If you hadn't, I'm not gonna have you raise your hand and say, hey, I didn't do that. But I hope you will at some point. But here's the next step to that. As we think about who we wanna become, based on who you want to become, what one habit do you need to start? Based on who you want to become, what one habit do you need to to start? What one discipline is gonna start to move you in the direction of who you want to become. Just just one. And I'll tell you, if this is something for you, which is most people, where it's like, man, I I don't, don't, there's a lot that I could do. Or maybe you're, you're thinking about a specific area of your life that you've never really been very disciplined in. Listen, that's okay. But don't, don't make something so crazy impossible. Don't, don't come up with some habit that's so overwhelming that you fail in the first week. In fact, I would say it would be better to start small. Start with something less significant and then begin to let it grow. Start, start with something like maybe for you, like you wake up every single morning and you hit the snooze four, five, six, like maybe sometimes over an hour, you're still hitting the snooze. Like I've been there, I do that sometimes. Not all the time, but I'll do that sometimes. And you, so maybe this year you just wanna say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna let the I'm gonna let the one thing I'm gonna change, I'm just gonna stop hitting my snooze and when it goes up, I'm gonna get up because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So I'm not gonna hit the snooze. So you're like, man, I'm not gonna hit the snooze this year. Maybe it's Bible reading before jumping on Instagram or Facebook. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna spend some time reading the Bible or maybe 
just praying with your kids, praying with your family, praying with your spouse. Maybe that's the one thing. Just focus on that. What do you need to do based on who do you want to become? There's a lot of different things, and I think we can all land somewhere else, but based on what that is, what is it that you want to do? And some of you, you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm, Wes, I'm just not a systems person. <laughs> Like you're talking about systems, you're talking about discipline, and I just, that's just not who I am. I've never been that way. I've never really practiced systems and discipline. I, I like to kind of just be free. I like to be free, and like free is great, but listen, free is a system. Because you can say that you're not a systems person, but systems are either by intent or they're by default. So think about that in your life. Maybe for you, let's go back to the snooze button for just a second. You're not a, you say you're not a person of systems. So every morning you, you wake up and you hit the snooze and then you hit it again and then you hit it again. You hit it four or five, six times. Like that's just how you roll. That's, that's what you do. That's a normal day for you, which puts you in a place where you wake up late and you're already behind. And so you kick the dog, which isn't good. Don't kick the dog. Kick the cat. Don't kick the dog. You yell at your kids. You're running behind. You're trying to drink your coffee while you're doing everything else around your house. And as the kids are going out the door getting, get, to get to the school bus, you yell at them and they're frustrated, they're upset because they're just, it's just a mess. And then you jump in the shower and you get out real quick and jump in the car and head to work. Your hair's still wet, just kind of frustrated. Everything's flushed, everything's quick, out of pace. So you're driving to work like a bat out of Hockley. And it's just, it's just <laughs> like the day is just not going the way you're supposed to go. You get to work and you're supposed to be looking at your emails from the day before, but instead you're putting your makeup on because it's just like, man, I'm running behind. I woke up late, I hit my snooze 12 times. And just the day is just, you, you feel it? You feel the tension? Some of you are like, Wes, this is too real right now. Have you been, have you been having secret cameras in my house and on my way to work lately? But you see how this begins to shape other things throughout the day. And then your day becomes unproductive. You're behind all day, so you end up having to work later. Or you don't get to take the day off the next day. And so then your spouse is frustrated because y'all had plans. You're like, man, I got to work late, or I'm going to have to work tomorrow. So there's frustration there. You get home. You're still mad at the dog. Kick the dog again. Like, it's just it, things aren't going well. And you finally, you sit down, and you've had a rough day. And maybe your spouse says, hey, uh, I know you're having some you time, but you want to have some us time. And you're like, no, not today, Satan. Like, just, you're just, and then you go to bed frustrated and guilty. And just you're like, man, this is a mess. Do you see the system? You see, there's always a system. Sometimes we don't pay attention to it, but it's there and it's shaping who we are and who we're becoming because you're not who you are now. That's not who you're always gonna be, but you do have a choice of who you become. I think it happens through intentional systems. So let me, let me share this briefly. So, so how do we do this? How do we come up with one new habit? There's this thing called, and it's talked about, I believe, in both of these books, but um, it's not, this isn't original, this is, this is kind of a, a known thing, but it's called the habit loop. And it starts with, this is how habits uh, are created. It starts with some sort of a, a trigger or a cue. We'll just call it a cue because it's shorter and less chance of me misspelling it. Um, there's this, there's something that you see. There's something that you, 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 you hear or that you recognize. You, you see the refrigerator, you see the pantry, you you. You, you, you get angry, you feel lonely, or it's a certain time of the day, but there's something that, that triggers your senses. And so there's this cue, and then after the cue, there's a response. We'll just call it action. So there's a cue, which always leads to a response. I'm gonna eat that piece of cake. I'm gonna yell at that person that won't get out of my way because they're on the left side uh, they're in the left lane, getting in my way, keeping me from being where I need to be because I hit my snooze five times. And so you show them that they're number one as you get, go by and yell at them because there's a response. There's a cue, there's a response. Maybe, maybe it's a healthy response. Maybe it's like, man, there's, there's a cue, there's a reminder. I'm reading my Bible this morning. I'm, I'm gonna journal. And so, but there's always action. There's a cue, there's a trigger, which leads to a response, which always leads to some kind of reward. There's the dopamine rush. There's the, the sugar rush. There's the pleasure. There's, the, there's, there's something that's a reward of the action. And sometimes it's what we're actually pursuing, and sometimes it's happening, and we don't even realize it's happening, but there's this, this cycle. There's this loop, because what happens is there's the trigger, the cue, which leads to the action, the response of, of what you do, which always leads to reward, and that reward goes away, and the loop continues. It's complete. It repeats itself 
all day long. And 40% of your day is a result of the habit loop. And so what, what can we do about this? Well, we can, we can change our habits. How do we change our habits? How do we start a new habit? Well, first, you do two things. You, you make the trigger, you make the cue, and you make the action two things. The first one, make it obvious. Make it super obvious so that you can't miss it. If you want to take vitamins every single day, then before you go to bed at night, set the vitamins out on the counter so they're the first thing you see when you go to make your cup of coffee. And you say, oh, there's my vitamins, trigger. So I'm going to take my vitamins, action. And then the reward begins to follow. If you want to be someone who writes an encouraging note to someone every single day, you're like, man, I just want to, you know, I have a tendency to focus on negative things, so I'm going to start writing an encouraging card of gratitude to people that I appreciate in my life. So I'm going to do that every single day. So before you go to bed at night, before you leave the office every evening, then take that card and a pen and set it in the middle of your desk. So the first thing you do when you walk into your office is you see that card, and there's a cue, there's a trigger, and it's obvious. It's really obvious. And so there's a response, there's an action that follows that leads to reward, and then it repeats itself. You see this habit loop taking place. So what would it look like to come up with a habit and focus on the cue and focus on the response, but make it super obvious? Not only do you make it obvious, but make it easy. Don't overcomplicate this. Maybe, maybe you're in a place where you're like, man, I really, I've always wanted to do this and I've just never really done it, but I really want to start reading the Bible more. Listen, if you've never spent time reading the Bible consistently, don't jump into this promise that you're going to read the entire Bible in 2024. Like it's doable and many of you have done it. But if you've never spent time reading the Bible, then maybe instead of saying, I'm going to read three to nine chapters a day, I'm just going to start with one verse. Just read one verse, one verse a day. And so you take your, your Bible and you, you set it on your pillow, maybe, so that before you go to sleep, you're reading that passage. Or maybe it's sitting on your nightstand. The first thing you do when you wake up is you, you read your Bible. And here's what might happen. As you read that one verse, you might become hungry for two verses. And if you're not careful, you can start thinking, man, I need to read a whole chapter. But start small and let it grow. Make it obvious. Make it easy. Maybe for you, it's start journaling. Or, and you're like, man, I, that's just overwhelming. It's something I do. It's something I believe in. I think it's super helpful, super healthy. Just spend some time. Just Not just dear diary, here was my day, but... What I do is oftentimes is I'll write out my prayers or I'll just sit there and think about the things where I saw God, saw, I saw God moving throughout the day. I saw God working. I, I experienced something that I knew was of God. And one thing it does is it keeps me in a place where I'm looking for those things and I stay aware of those things and it, it, it grows your faith. But don't focus on writing three pages every time you journal. Just focus on one line, two lines. And you might get to a place where you're like, man, I can do five lines. I can do six lines. I can, I can do a whole page, but don't, don't focus there. Make it easy. Keep it easy. Make it obvious. Here's what this really looks like. There's the cue. There's the action, the reward. So here's the statement that I want you to kind of focus on this week. It's simply this. After I, comma, I, after I blank, comma, I will blank, comma, for, for Daniel, it would be, after I eat breakfast and I scramble my eggs, I'm going to pray. And then after I eat my pulled pork sandwich from Bucky's, I'm, actually he was Jewish, it'd be a brisket sandwich. After I eat my brisket sandwich from Bucky's, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray. And then after dinner, I'm going to pray. You see, there was, a, there was a cue. There was a trigger. So after I, I will. He knew what he was to do because he knew who he was started thinking this week because I, I went to a funeral on Friday for a man named Dick Hill, and I know many of you know Dick Hill and um, have had, your life's probably been influenced by him because I don't really know anybody that's ever met this man, and something he did, something he said, something, just something about him that didn't influence your life in some way. He was just that kind of a guy, and I'm sitting at his funeral on Friday with this message kind of marinating in my mind. I was listening to the things people were saying about this man. And I've been to a lot of funerals where, you know, I think sometimes in, in the emotion of the moment, we can say a lot of things that honestly can become a little bit of an exaggeration about someone, or we just focus on things that we, we think were true or we hope were true about them. And so people say a lot of things at, at, at funerals, and, and they're mostly true, but for this man, for Dick, I was sitting there listening, and I'm just like, man, the things people are saying are unbelievable. 
and 100% accurate. He was just a man who was like that. And I started thinking about my own life. And the question we asked last week, who do I want to become? Well, I want to become like Jesus, but I want to become a man like Dick Hill, who when my time on this earth is finished, people get up and say those kinds of things to me, and they're 100% accurate. I can tell you right now, that's not true for me. It's probably not true for any of us because there's always more progress to be made, which is where new habits come into play because we're focused on who do we want to become. It's so important to think about that this week. Why? Because successful people do consistently what others do occasionally. When you know who you are, when you know who you want to become, then you know what to do. We all have the same goals. We all have similar goals, but we have very different results. Here's what I know to be true. Goals are good for setting direction, but systems are best for making progress and to keep the journey going in a healthy place. I'll land with this. I, as I was kind of processing, I, I was thinking about just my own life, and this is something I've, I've wrestled with probably a lot over the last two or three years. But I think for, for you, if, if you don't know me well, and we've not spent a lot of time together, then looking at me from a distance or just looking at me from the outside, you might find yourself in a place thinking, man, he's a pastor. Um, he's got all this down. Like, he's kind of figured this out. He's had some, he's had some success in, in whatever he, he's wanting to do as a pastor. And um, it's easy to kind of, from a distance, look and, and think that about people. But one of the things that I've realized over the, the last few years is that when I find myself in places of personal success, and what I mean by that is where I've, I've accomplished something that I've always wanted to do or I've always dreamed of being a part of, when I find myself in that moment, I quickly go to, but there's something better. There's something more. There's something greater than this. And I fail to enjoy the moment. And one of the things we talk about, even at church story a lot, is great isn't good enough. Great just isn't good enough. And the reason we say that is because I want us to always be evaluating. I want us to always be thinking about the way that things are. Because what's great right now may not always be great. And there's adjustments that need to be made. But I think that can get to an unhealthy place. Because you can find yourself, if you're like me, you can find yourself in a place where you're always wanting more. You're always wanting something else. You're always wanting something better. And what happens is we begin, to, we begin to live with the wrong goals. And the kinds of goals we begin to live with are goals that I would call means goals. Not mean girls. <laughs> means goals. Well, what is a means goal? Well, it's a, it's a goal that leads to something else. It's, it's an end to a means. It's a means to an end. I'm looking forward to something and I've got this goal to accomplish this because on the other side of that goal, there's always a so. So I go to school to make good grades so I can get into a better school. So that I can get a good degree, so that I can graduate, so that I can get a decent job, so I can get a good paycheck, so that I can make a good living, so I can take her out on a date because those are expensive, so that maybe we can get married and go on this awesome honeymoon someday, so that we can raise a family, so that we can maybe have a nice house, and on and on and on. Here's what happens. When we begin to live with means goals, there's always a so. And as long as there's a, a so at the end of our goal, then contentment and satisfaction, fulfillment, joy is always deterred to the future. And we never recognize the success in the present. And I don't, I don't think that's the way that we've been created to live. So maybe, instead of, instead of setting means goals, maybe we just need to set end goals. And the only end that I can find at the end of every so is not a what, but a who. It's not about what am I doing. It's not about where am I going. It's all about who am I becoming. More importantly, am I becoming more like Christ? Because that's the goal. Am I becoming more like Christ? Am I becoming more like Jesus? I think that was true for Dick Hill. 
And so I think he's an incredible example. But what I want for us is that we would be in a place where we think about who we wanna become, but we're not looking to the future for success. We're looking to today because I think you can actually enjoy success today because success is not in the accomplishing of some goal. The success is found in just simply being obedient. Just being obedient with one faithful step today. Otherwise, you're always looking to the future to find that satisfaction. I think about it with my boys. When they were little in the backyard, they would play t-ball, they would play baseball, and I would walk outside sometimes, and they were terrible. I mean, they were like three and four. And so to hit a moving ball with a bat that was even oversized, like was almost impossible until it wasn't. And all of a sudden one day I walk outside and Brain's like, dad, watch, dad, watch, 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 watch. Cam throws in the ball like 17 times because they were all over the place. And there's finally a strike. What does Brain do? He makes contact, he hits it. Did you see it, dad? Did you see it? I did it, I did it. I'm gonna do it again, watch dad, dad, watch. He was finding joy in that moment. He was finding success in that moment. I think it's a picture of what it looks like to trust God and not look to the future for success, but just simply find success in the obedience, in the right now. Like, God, I'm not everything you want me to be, but today I'm gonna take the steps and I'm gonna be obedient to continue to become that today. And in that, find success. And I'll leave you with this. Success is not hitting the goal in the future. Success is honoring God today. I know that habit, I know that system was not super complicated. I know it was kind of small, but God, you know what? Your word also says that when we're faithful with a little, wow, oh my gosh, that you'll trust us with even more. And don't get confused in thinking that success is more. Success is simply being faithful and obedient today. Let's pray. God, I thank you.